Good morning again. Good morning. And Shabbat Shalom. Renier, welcome, man. Glad you are with us. That's very exciting. Edgar has talked quite often in the last few months about his excitement about you coming back home and, and uh, being able to be here to hang out with us. So uh, if you need anything, we're your family. You just let us know. Uh, how many of you woke up this morning? Let's see. Raise your hands. Just wanted to start with that. Um, do you have any idea how many choices we have to make in a day on average? Anybody ever thought about it? How many decisions? A lot. How many think? What do you think? Average day, how many choices you got to make? Over a thousand? That's safe. How about 35,000 on average? Let me, let me walk you through something, just so you can see how this starts. Uh, let's say, uh, how many have an alarm? We set the alarm. You ever wondered why we're so surprised when it goes off in the morning? Because didn't you set it the night before? And then it goes off and we're like, surprised. But we did that, right? But the alarm goes off, and what, what's the choice you have to make? Okay, and, and, and you have all of this information, all these data points you have to go through, whether you're going to get out of bed or not. And if you're not going to get out of bed, you might hit the snooze alarm, right? Mm -hmm. And then it goes off again. you got another choice to make. So let's say you get out of bed. You're up. What choices do you have in front of you now? Take a shower, right? Do I have to take a shower? Am I going to eat breakfast? Do I have time to eat breakfast? Do I want to eat breakfast? Am I hungry? Look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. Never do that in the morning. You have your foghorn, leghorn voice in the morning. Sound like Elmer Fudd in the morning. You decide if you're going to go to church or not, let's say, this morning. Right? A lot of information goes into making that decision. But you have a choice to make. Some people didn't come to church this morning. Some people chose to. The route that you drive. How are you going to get to church this morning? How fast are you going to go? I mean, that's just starting out in a few minutes in the beginning of the morning and by the end of the day, there's some 35,000 choices uh, that, that we have to make. Like remembering to click on this and to turn the sermon on and all those choices. Let's see if this works. Okay. We also have a choice as to whom we serve. Right? You can choose to believe in God or not. You can choose what religious affiliation you have. You can choose how you see God. The God that I worship, by the way, is huge. Created the whole universe. Everything that there ever has been and ever will be was all created by this God that I worship who spoke everything into existence. Think of the power behind that. Joshua 24.15 says, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, which seems pretty weird, but there's a choice. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Because everybody serves somebody. Whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. That is a choice. Susan and I in our house, we serve the Lord. We don't have to. We could choose not to. We could decide that it's evil for us to serve the Lord. And we could choose something else if we wanted to. Nobody's putting a gun to our head and forcing us to believe a certain way. God doesn't do that, does he? I know some religions, they'll do that. They will put pressure on people to believe in certain things. But that's not how the God that I worship works. It's a choice. I have free will. He doesn't want somebody, I don't believe from what I read in the Bible, God doesn't want people following him that follow him out of fear or obligation or under pressure. He wants people that, that worship him because they love him. So we're going to start today with a little bit of a history lesson. 
And I'm going to go through a bit of Joshua 24. It's a wonderful chapter in the Bible. I encourage you to read it in its entirety. But it starts this way. It says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So he's starting out with this story, this little history lesson, and said, here's how it was in the beginning, or back when, when, when these folks were, um, were serving other gods on the other side of the river, they weren't serving the Lord. It goes on and it says, And then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river, and I led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his descendants, and gave him Isaac. And to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. And to Esau I gave the mountains of Seir to possess, but Jacob and his children, they went, they went down to Egypt. So this is a history lesson that also talks about how God rescued his children. So it's a story of hope. It's a story that's uplifting that should give us confidence in the Lord. It goes on to say in, in 24, now in verses 5 through 7, it says, I also sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to what I did among them. Afterward, I brought you out. That's a very quick history lesson in two sentences there about the Exodus and about rescuing the nation of Israel from Pharaoh, right? Here, uh, God is sort of recapping his efforts to save his children, not only from slavery, right, but from the pagan practice of worshiping other gods. So they, he, they weren't just rescued from Egypt as slaves subject to all this um, physical labor and burden and abuse. He was also trying to rescue them from the pagan rituals that were being practiced there. It goes on, and it talks about how he made them great. Now verses 7 to 11. And then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. So here's the Exodus story, right? In fact, how long were they in the wilderness? 40 years. 40 years. Now, you know, it's just an interesting bit of information, but, but I hear people talk about how the Jews wandered in the desert for 40 years. They didn't really wander in the desert for 40 years. They only wandered in the desert for a couple of years because they spent about 38 years at the same encampment. They were there the whole time. So it's not like every day they packed up their tents and they put their backpacks on and they went off to the next place. That happened during the initial year and a half or almost two years and then, and then they spent uh, 38 years sort of stationary. Now they were still in the wilderness, but they weren't wandering necessarily the whole time, but they were removed um, from any permanent, um, any permanent home. It says, I brought you into the land of the Amorites who dwelt on the other side of the Jordan, and they fought with you. But I gave them into your hand, that you might possess their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, he arose to make war against Israel, and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. Oh, God says, but I wouldn't listen to Balaam. And therefore, he continued to bless you. So I delivered you out of his hand. This is quite a story of deliverance, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All those people that opposed you, but, but you don't have to worry about it. I got, I got you covered. The gangs are up against you. The enemy's up against you. No big deal, because I'm already there, right? My hand of protection is already over you. You know, it's, it's interesting because... When we make a conscious choice to walk away from God, even though he continues to love us, his hand of protection is removed, and we are on our own. And I don't know about you, but I don't do very well when I'm on my own. I, my, I was having a particularly <clears throat> difficult period, I think, one time, and Susan uh, told me, she said, well, you know, um, she said, everything happens for a reason. And then she went on to tell me that sometimes the reason is you make really bad choices. <laughs> and so, and that's true. 
And so if I make bad choices, if I choose not to be under the protection of God anymore, bad things are going to happen. And I'm not going to have any control over it. It says, but I gave them into your hand. He goes on and tells the story. I delivered you out of his hand. And then you went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you. Number three, also the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Girgashites, the Hivites, the Jebusites. We could be talking about armies and gangs and groups of people contemporaneously. It doesn't matter that we're out there and, and all these people were against you. But I delivered them into your hand, the Lord said as well. And then, and then he gave them a home. And it goes on to say that I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, also the two kings of the Amorites, but not with your sword or with your bow. I have given you a land. Now listen to this. This is absolutely beautiful, guys. This is, to me, epitomizes God's grace. I gave you a land for which you did not labor. So you didn't deserve this land, but I gave it to you anyway. You did nothing to earn this place. You didn't work for it, but it's yours. And cities that you did not build. Wow, how cool is that, right? So I'm giving you land that you did nothing to earn. I'm giving you cities that you did no work to build and you will dwell over that in them. And you're even gonna eat of the vineyards and the olive groves, which you did not plant. And now the choice comes. Joshua 24, 14 and 15. So now we have a historical perspective to the verse from today. Let's read it again, having some better idea of how we got to this point. Now, therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. What's he tell us to do? Serve the Lord. And it goes on to say, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. So now let's get this in perspective. Why would it seem evil to them to serve the Lord? Why would they even think about the idea that it would be evil to serve the Lord? Because that's what their ancestors did. You know, when I, when I went from, uh, when I became a Christian, when I accepted Jesus as the Messiah, um, being born and raised Jewish, it was a difficult decision to make for one reason. Not because I had this internal struggle as to whether it was true or not. I knew it was. I read the first four Gospels and I was immediately converted. There was no question in my mind that Jesus is the Messiah. The conflict comes from this. My ancestors, my dad, he didn't believe that, and he was pretty educated in Judaism. My grandfather was Orthodox. He lived in a Hasidic neighborhood. He was a Rebbe, right? He was kind of right there with the rabbis. And, and he didn't believe this was true. And all the, the, the rabbis that he hung out with, they didn't think this was true. How could all those people have been wrong? A lot of times when we come to Jesus, the difficulty is not the internal struggle that we have to deal with. It's that, that historical and traditional aspect of our ancestry, of the people that didn't believe. So we not only have to believe that this is true for us, we have to believe that they were wrong all that time. So when the question comes, and if it seems evil to you, to serve the Lord, that's because their ancestors did not serve the Lord. They served the gods on the other side of the Jordan. So it's not a far, it's not far-fetched to believe that this was a difficult choice for them to make because they now had to not only accept a new theology, they had to reject an old theology that seemed to have been practiced by their ancestors. So if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods 
of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So the question is, what's your choice? And it goes on to say, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. In fact, I'd like to say that together. Can we read that together so that we all make this choice now? So, but for, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. Doesn't matter where you are. Doesn't matter where you live, what your conditions are like. This is a choice that we can make is to serve the Lord. And this, that process transcends all social and geographic and geopolitical and economic and demographic um, characteristics. It just doesn't matter, you know. You know, me, I'm, um, what I do for a living is I'm a, a, what's called a computational statistician. And I believe that mathematics is a language that transcends all cultures. When I go to this meeting, it's called the Joint Statistical Meeting of the American Statistical Association. They have this once a year. And we went, we we're out west that time, and there was 6,500 mathematicians from all over the world that showed up and many of them there were there had to have been 80 different languages there and some people just you couldn't communicate but you could communicate through mathematics because it is a common language love is a common language if somebody's hurting and you can't speak their language and you don't know why they're hurting a hug works no matter who you are and whether you can communicate or not. And making a choice to serve God transcends all of those characteristics. It, it is an absolute uniter. You know, people talk about this. We need to unite. Uh, we're all divided and fractured. That is what unites people, is a common love for the Lord God. So what did the people say? Right? Like say, the people said, Amen. It goes on to say, so the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. So they said, Amen. We agree with what you're saying. Far be it for us that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. Ne won't happen, right? For the Lord our God is he who brought us out of our fathers up out, and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt. They're remembering. This is the Lord with his outstretched arm that rescued us from slavery. From the house of bondage who did those great signs in our sight and preserved us in all the way that we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites, who dwelt in the land. And they said, we also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. So for me and my house today, we choose to serve the Lord. And the people said, hey, Amen. we're going to serve the Lord also, Amen. for he is our God. And this word, our God, this is similar to the Shema. Um, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And that Echad is a unity statement. It, is, it doesn't mean one, actually, if you look in the Hebrew, the old Hebrew translation, it means a unity. It doesn't say the Trinity, but it says that it's a union. I'm not uh, into pantheism, but we here today are all children of the same God. Amen. You know, it's interesting. You don't have to believe that's true. But you're wrong. <laughs> right? There are people who will say, well, we worship a different God. Well, that's fine, but you're wrong. Or there isn't just one God of the whole universe. That's your opinion. That's okay. That's a choice, but it's the wrong choice. It's a poor choice to make. Because you're going to have to serve somebody. 
you know, I have read enough studies into um, psychosocial development and um, neurophysiology that I have come to believe from the, the research that human beings um, are not, do not possess the ability to be truly independent. <clears throat> we, are, we have a sense of dependency, which is how addictions form, by the way. It's what I call a God hole. Everybody has a God hole in them. We have this thing that needs to be filled with something. <clears throat> we could fill it with drugs or alcohol or other people or money or uh, other desires or whatever, uh, but all those things are fleeting and eventually they don't work anymore. But if we fill it with God, that is a permanent solution. So if we don't serve God, we got to serve somebody else. We're going to serve Satan if we don't serve the Lord because we are dependent. That's just our psychosocial makeup. That's not the world according to Frank. That tends to be based on uh, um, a lot of scholarly articles and good research that, that has been done. So in Matthew 6, 24, 24, it says, oh, 6, 24, it says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and man. I had a friend who said it this way. He said, you can't ride one, two horses with one bottom. It just doesn't work. Miss White writes this. We cannot serve God with a divided heart. Bible religion is not one influence among many others. Its influence is to be supreme. Do you read that? Bible influence is not just one of the many influences that should be affecting our lives, that should be directing our choices. It is the influence that should be directing our decisions and our choices, pervading, pervading, pervasive, and controlling every other. Every other influence should be pervaded by and controlled by a biblical influence, our relationship with God. What's the verse say that we should focus first on the righteousness of the kingdom of heaven and then everything else will be added to it. The t-shirt says Jesus Christ and then on the bottom it says the rest is just details. It is not, it is not to be like a dash of color brushed here and there upon the canvas, but it is to pervade the whole life as if the canvas were dipped into the color until every thread of the fabric were dyed a deep, unfading hue. Is that an amazing description of how embedded we should be in our relationship with Christ? What, what's it? It's a cinch by the inch, right? Think about, think about Solomon's apostasy, right? It happened before he was even aware of it. He wandered away from God. But until you read in Ecclesiastes, he didn't even know that it had happened until it was too late. Because we, we're so familiar with those minute-by-minute -minute changes in our lives. I get up in the morning, I look in the mirror, and there I am, right? But I can't imagine being in a 20-year coma and then waking up and looking in the mirror and now seeing myself. I remember going to you know, a, my 40-year class reunion and looking at my classmates going, man, what, what happened to them? You know? And I know they're over there looking at me going, wow, is that really Frank? What happened to him? You know? It's a cinch by the end. So almost imperceptibly, he begins to trust less and less in divine guidance, and he begins to put confidence in his own strength. That's what happens to us. It's a cinch by the inch. We are, so, so the question we ask is where are we um, in our walk with Jesus? I remember uh, taking Morgan one time and her friends to the Long Center playground. And they went around asking all the kids if they believed in Jesus. Isn't that great? Right? Susan, when Maya was on the plane with you, First time she ever flew, and, and the lady next to her 
she asked her if she knew Jesus, right? How old, how old was Maya? She was eight at the time. Yeah. She was eight, and the lady said, she was witnessing to her, and the lady said, well, my boyfriend and I were spiritual, not religious. And Maya looked, Maya looked at her, and she said, well, I don't know what that means, but I sure hope you know Jesus. Right. <laughs> Amen. From the mouth of babes. From the mouth of babes. Because they're not worried about what people are going to think about them yet, you know? Are we at a place in our Christian life where we don't see any fruit? I mean, look, we become um, habituated, right? We become habituated to the way we live. We become desensitized many times to what's going on around us. There's so much suffering right now in this world. People are hurting everywhere. We become desensitized to that, and that's unfortunate, uh, you know. I'm not going to get into lecturing on what you should or shouldn't do, but, but you know, the more time we spend, for example, with, in front of media, being exposed to things that are purposely exaggerated many times to show the worst of the worst, the more desensitized uh, we can become. Have we ever really experienced significant transformation, change, or breakthrough? If I had asked asked each of you to come up here and to give a testimony on, on when that moment happened in your life. Could you do that, right? Are we still experiencing that exciting transformation every day in our relationship with Christ? And have we lost the feeling of the exhilaration we got when we first gave our hearts to the Lord? You know, recently there was this big lottery. It was actually a billion dollars. And one ticket was sold and somebody in Michigan won it. Imagine that. You wake up tomorrow morning, and the lottery was called Saturday night, and you check your ticket, and you just won a billion dollars. I mean, you'd be dancing and screaming and yelling like, oh. You'd be calling your, well, maybe you wouldn't call your friends. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's true. But you might, and you'd be like freaking out. I won, I won a billion dollars. Can you believe this? But I think that's how we should feel about being saved, right? Because that billion dollars only lasts for so long, but salvation can be eternal, Amen. right? Forever. And so, so why aren't I as excited about being saved as I am about winning the lottery? Why aren't I yelling it off into the, in, into the streets, you know, about that as well? Am, am I... Do I still feel exhilarated uh, because I have a promise of eternal life? Because the creator of the entire universe chose me. So I heard this, uh, I heard this talk one time by a Christian counselor. And, and he was, I think it was a, one of those V blogs, whatever you call it, video blog things. Anyway, he was talking about um, in relationships, how uh, at some point people can become habituated. You become um, familiar and you lose that exhilaration that you had of the relationship. And he said, go back to the beginning and remember what it was that first attracted you about, you know, to that person. Go back into that place where those feelings were. So I say we do that the same way with our relationship with Christ. What brought you to the cross? I mean, think about it. Was it, a, was it a crisis that brought you to the foot of the cross? Was it um, just disgust with your life? Was it you were born into it and that just is a natural part of who you are, what you do? Was it the result of reading something or being somewhere? But I believe that most people, when they came to the foot of the cross, most people that I know, they come on their knees because they're looking for some salvation in their lives. Go back to the beginning. Malachi 3.7 says, Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my decrees and failed to obey them. Now return to me. How many times did Israel do this? Return to me and I'll return to you. Every other king of Israel, right? That's how it was, says the Lord of heaven's armies. 
Uh, this is um, from a blog called Transform Daily. And this is just something that was posted by this guy, Eric Jones. He's no famous person or anything. But he said, go back to the beginning and encounter Christ in his fullness. Believe in him with all your heart. Accept the cross. Come to Christ in godly sorrow. Experience true repentance. And then the feeling will come back. So he's saying, look, go back to the basics, right? Just the basics of this idea of Christianity. And then that feeling, that exhilaration will come back. The change will then happen. You will begin, uh, you will begin experiencing real transformation and experiencing that first love all over again. Amen. Because remember, what we read is it's not one of many influences. It is the pervading influence in our life. Life is all about choices. Deuteronomy 30, uh, 19 says, Today I have given you the choice between life and death, between blessings and curses. I call on heaven and earth to witness the choice you make. And you should know that that is the case, that heaven and earth will witness the choice that we make of whom we choose to serve today. Oh, that you would choose life and that your descendants might live. Amen. Choose to love the Lord your God and to obey him and commit yourself to him, for he is your life. Amen. Then, this is a Boolean statement, then you will live long in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham, Yitzhak, and Jacob. What was, that, what was that story about the guy gets up in the morning, and uh, he's all grumpy. His wife says, come on, we got to get up and get ready for church. And he says, I, I, I'm not going to church today. I don't want to go to church. And she said, well, that's crazy. Why? He says, I'm just tired of it. People don't like me there. It's, um, you know, it's crazy. She says, give me three reasons why you don't want to go to church. Well, the people don't like me, and, and uh, I don't like them, and... and and uh, I'm just exhausted all the time. Every time I do this, there's so much to do. You give me one reason why I should go to church. And she said, you're the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a good idea to get up and go. It's all about the choices that we make. God chose me. Have you ever thought about that? God, the creator of the universe, that all-powerful being who spoke everything we can imagine into existence. Yeah. He chose me. That's just amazing, you know? I, I'm a fascinated sometimes that Susan chose me. Because I think she could have done much better. But I'm not going to argue it because I'm glad she chose me. God chose each of us. He could have chose anybody, but he chose us. Ezekiel 25 and 6 says, Give them this message from the Sovereign Lord. When I chose Israel, when I revealed myself to the descendants of Jacob and Egypt, I took a solemn oath that I, the Lord, would be their God. This is from Spurgeon's Morning and Evening. It's a devotional from uh, so many of the sermons that were given by Spurgeon. It says, how are they his? By his own sovereign choice. How about that? How is it that I'm a child of God? Did I, do I choose to be a child of God? Well, I choose to accept the invitation. But God chose me first to be a child of God. He chose them and set his love upon them. This he did altogether apart from any goodness in them at the time or any goodness which he foresaw in them. He had mercy on them, on whom he would have mercy, and ordained a chosen company unto eternal life. Thus, therefore, are they his by his unconstrained election. You know what that means? You know why we're God's children? Because he decided that we were his children. He chose us. And that's why we are children of God. Because he chose us to be his children. So in closing, but as for me and my house, what? We will serve the Lord. 
I don't know if you know who Henri Nouwine is. Have you ever heard of him? He's a, he's a Roman Catholic priest that is just kind of a brilliant writer, um, expositor. He, he writes this. He says, when you are eating, drinking, working, playing, speaking, or writing is no longer for the glory of God. So when all these things that you do no longer glorifies God, you should stop it immediately. Is that great? Yeah. Because when you no longer live for the glory of God, what happens? You begin to live for your own glory. Why is that? Because you're going to have to serve somebody. Then you separate yourself from God and you do yourself harm. Your main question should always be whether something is lived with or without God. I saw this... Uh, I saw this vehicle, it had a bumper sticker, it said, God is my co-pilot. I'm going to get some bumper stickers made up that says, God is my pilot. Because he's not my co-pilot. I might be his co-pilot if I'm lucky. But there's no way God is my co-pilot because he's flying this bird, he's driving this bus, he's milking this cow, right? It's God who's in control and in charge all the time. Whether we believe it or not, that is the truth. So for me and my house today, we will choose to serve the Lord. Amen? Amen. So uh, here's my challenge for you for this week. I want you all to take some time and think about what it is that brought you to the foot of the cross in the first place. And then go back to the beginning. Go back to those feelings. Go back to that time and try to relive that a little bit. Go back to the basics that brought us to Christ and that caused us to want to just spread that gospel message because we are so excited and so exhilarated about our own salvation. Let us close. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Dismissed. Susan?